Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. Everyone obviously keep eating. Others will come in, I'm sure. Uh, we had really strong attendance for this one. So Sherry, you have raised raised the bar each time. There's been uh, uh, more and more. And as the word gets out, because it really is about uh, the four um, entities, four organizations that are on your property tax bill and explaining what, where does the money go and uh, where does it come from in that. So I think people are getting more and more interested in this. Um, it's been very gratifying to know that there hasn't really been a venue like this for um, just to talk about um, these kinds of, um, kinds of issues, really informational. We really focus on the is and not the ought. Uh, which is why we're having the finance directors who knows know what the is is um, here discussing it. The ought is gets you more into the political realm and that kind of thing, all good stuff, but really focusing on what is it that's happening right now so then people can make very wise, informed decisions on the ought. Um, so uh, with that, I want to introduce uh, Professor Laura Group from uh, Beloit College. She has been instrumental in um, setting up the, the framework for these conversations, the informational paper that is on our website. You can also see the introduction that she is, a version of the introduction she's giving this morning. Uh, we recorded that, that's on the website. Uh, Eric Miller, who's the finance director for the city is here and he really kicked off this whole series and his whole presentation was recorded and is on our website as well as will be today's. So um, with that, we're keeping it very informal, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of uh, Professor Laura Groove, got her undergraduate, we're not gonna do that kind of stuff. Um, and then I'll let her uh, introduce Sherry. Okay. All right. Good afternoon. I just wanna mention thank you uh, very much to State Line Community Foundation for providing the lunches. They have been a key partner in this, um, in this uh, program. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Nick. So um, Nick and I, of course, have been working on this project, this Know Your Local Government series, but I also want to mention uh, Emeritus Professor Jeff Adams, who is here. Um, he and I, as uh, Nick was, was alluding to, there is a document that we put together over the summer that really goes through your property tax bill um, and talks about how, how um, these, th these four different components and what a mill rate is and um, all sorts of things. So please, if you do have a chance, go to the website and maybe take a look at that. Um, I wanted to add just a little bit to the motivation for this series because I think it is important. Um, and really, so the motivation is this concern that information about local government is not uh, widely available and it's certainly not widely understood. Um, much of the news that we see today tends to be national news and it seems more and more difficult to find local stories and to know kind of what's happening in your own backyard. Um, importantly, research suggests that a decline in local news also leads to higher levels of partisanship um, and it also poses a challenge to advocates of open and transparent government. Um, so with that in mind, though, we do want to acknowledge that the Beloit Daily News has been covering this series, and we certainly hope that they continue to do so. Our primary goal is to educate the residents of Beloit, and dare I say, we do make a normative claim that people ought to take an active interest in their local government. And we really have three kind of key reasons for, for why you should know your local government. Um, you know, the first being that local government absolutely affects your day-to-day -day life and quality of life. Um, we know that decisions by the local school board, for example, impact the quality of the education that our children receive. Decisions by the city have ramifications for policing and public safety. Second point, um, it's certainly easiest to affect change at a local level. Uh, as a resident, you can meet with and make an appeal to your elected officials. You can provide feedback on an issue being discussed at a city council meeting. And in small cities and towns like Beloit, uh, it's, it's easier to have your voice heard. So you are one out of 36,000. Um, 
And then finally, local government decisions impact your, your pocketbook. So we are talking about the property tax bill. If you're a property owner, you pay for local government through your property tax. Of course, local governments also collect revenue from residents through other fees and other sources. That's part of what I, I think Sherry's gonna be sharing uh, with us today, this idea of what are the sources of revenues for different um, jurisdictions and also the, the uses of those revenues. Um, so I think that's all that I'm, I'm gonna say. I'm gonna, you know, of course, thank Sherry so much for not only preparing the presentation, but um, offering to make herself available today to share this with us. Um, I imagine that she'll probably make remarks for maybe about 40 minutes and then we can leave uh, time for, for Q&A at the end. Um, so without further ado, thank you, Sherry. Okay, hi, can everybody hear me? All right, so as Laura mentioned, I am Sherry Oja, Rock County Finance Director. I've been with the county for almost 16 years now, um, 11 of it as finance director. Um, and before the county, I worked for the state legislative audit bureau. So I was one of those dreaded people that went into the state agencies to audit them. So I've been around government, um, working for government for, for quite some time. So I guess first, we'll start with the basics. What is a county? It is um, a local government, and it's um, ruled, you know, governed by a board of supervisors. Rock County has 29, but I believe it can range in, in the state from as little as 11 to up to maybe 35. So um, Rock County has 29, and then there's several governing committees. So, um, for example, my governing committee is the Finance Committee which governs um, finance, IT, register of deeds, clerk of courts. Um, and so each committee has uh, a range of departments. Um, and then counties either have an elected county executive or an appointed county administrator, or there are, are a lot of, especially smaller counties that have an administrative coordinator. So Rock County has the, um, uh, County Administrator. So the counties provide lots of services, and we'll go through a few of those later. Um, but what's different about counties than um, cities, villages, and towns, our counties are the administrative arm of the state. So um, we can, the counties can only function, do the services that the um, state specifically says we're allowed to do or mandates us to do. So for example, what counties are required to do is maintain judicial court records, manage state elections, keep vital statistics. Um, some of you may have gone to the Register of Deeds, you know, for um, birth and death certificates, property records, um, marriage certificates, um, and then also um, various state programs are mandated for the county to administer, such as um, various operations in the health and human services, and such smaller things such as hazmat services. So the state requires every county to have a hazmat team available. Each county doesn't have to have, you know, doesn't have to be county employees, so Rock County um, contracts with the city of Janesville with their fire department um, for the hazmat team. So here is the county organizational chart. There are 27 departments in the county. Um, the solid lines are the departments that the County Board of Supervisors has supervision over. The dotted lines are um, not supervision of the, of, of the department, but budgetary authority over the department. These um, offices right over here are the elected ones. Over there are appointed directors. 
And then up at the top, the circuit court judges, they are state employees. However, the county is required to provide them with the support staff. So the county pays for the judicial <coughs> assistance, administrative staff, and, and such. So the county has some budgetary authority over there. However, we are required also to provide um, that staff. So as you can see over here, there's quite the range of um, county departments from land conservation, child support, uh, IT that keeps us all, all going, um, airport. So there's quite a variety that the county um, is responsible for. So how do we pay for all of that? What does it cost? Well, the 2023 Rock County budget is two, a little over $218 million, about 218.7. So how do we get to that number? Um, the budget process, I think you'll find it similar to the city of Beloit, what um, Eric presented. It's quite the long and intensive process. It starts in around May and June. Um, uh, especially the larger departments like human services, um, health department, public works, airport, um, do pre-budget presentations to a joint county board staff and finance committees. These presentations are open to the public, so a lot of times we get other board supervisors or a member of the public to um, come to these. And it's basically, you know, the departments present how is the year going so far, the current year, what do they think the new year is going, are there is going to be any big initiatives they're asking for, any new state requirements, you know, what they will likely be asking for in their budget. So it kind of gives the county board supervisors and committees a little sneak peek of what might be happening in, in the budget. So then in July, then the departments need to submit their detailed budget to administra administration and finance. Then August through September, administration staff and finance staff meet with every department and we go through it in, in pretty big you know, detail. It gets down to, you know, the, the budgets they submit are very detailed. You know, telephone, office supplies, um, training, smaller things like that, as well as the larger um, things like personnel for um, capital projects. And then um, usually by the end of September, beginning of October, the county administrator has made his recommendation for the budget within the financial constraints, as we'll see a little bit later. Then in October, um, first the county administrator presents a high level budget overview, a report to the county board and gives them the, gives them the budget. And then a few days later, um, a week maybe later, he goes through the budget <coughs> at the county board meeting, department at, by department. I'd say it, on average it takes about maybe three hours or so where they go through it in detail. County board members can ask questions. Um, then departments discuss their individual recommended budgets with their governing committee. So after the uh, presentation to the county board, then the governing committees are there. They can ask even more detail. Beginning of November, there's a public hearing where um, citizens come, come in and weigh in on the budget, give their opinions, things they want to ask for uh, or cut. Thanks, too. Uh, and then mid November, the county board adopts the budget. By November 15th, then we have to send the apportionment to the other 29 municipalities um, for the tax bills. So, how is the county funded? So, these are the various revenue categories for 2023. So as you can see, um, uh, the biggest one is intergovernmental <coughs> revenues, and then um, taxes and interest on taxes, which includes um, property taxes um, and interest on delinquent taxes. Um, just a little 
side note, I don't really have this later in the presentation, but once tax collections are, are completed um, for that current year, the, the county then um, makes this, all the rest of the municipalities whole. And so then the county has the um, property tax receivables on their books. Um, so first, I'll, I'll go through um, <coughs> the three largest categories, like um, intergovernmental revenues, taxes, and also a little um, update on, on the debt. So since, uh, again, the county is the administrative arm of the state, we have quite the uh, this, these are just a few of the examples. We have quite the span of what kind of aid and federal grants we get. So Rockhaven, that's not really a grant, that's Medicare, Medicaid payments for, for residents there. Um, child support, 66% uh, federal reimbursement, and then a lot of the rest of their costs are um, funded by state aid. Land conservation, um, you can see there, uh, Again, all, all these different examples, I won't go through them all, and it's just a smattering of the types of examples of grants and aid and charges that we have to the state and federal government. <coughs> now, sales tax collections. So the county has, um, collects half a percent sales tax on each purchase made in the county. So um, as you'll probably know, the sales tax percentage in the county is 5.5%. So the state gets 5% and the county gets half. Now the top line is the total sales taxes we've collected over the years. And the green line is budgeted. So we always budget a little bit conservatively. That way um, the excess sales tax, as we call it, is put in a special assigned fund balance for say future projects. So for a while there, you, you can see that the gap was a little wide. We were saving up um, our excess sales taxes and we we're able to put uh, 4 million towards the new jail LES project I'm sure everybody has heard about. Um, and we've made it, trying to make it a point to put as many of the sales tax collection into capital and one-time projects. That way it lowers what we need to issue debt for. So it lowers basically the debt levy. Uh, we started collecting the taxes in uh, March or April of 2007. Um, and uh, some of the sales, it was a prior administration, some of the sales taxes were put into operation. But for the last several years, um, we have, um, kept the operational level the same and all the additional uh, taxes we collect have been used for capital and one-time projects, such as um, road construction, um, um, the, the, you know, building, uh, building repair, new roofs, roof repair, um, and, and that kind of thing, um, cars for the, the sheriff's office. Um, so. Any questions so far about that? I'll move on. Nope. Right. Sorry, I'm going kind of fast here. It's just kind of a high level overview. Okay, the next tax, the, the Roth County tax levy is made up of um, four basically types of tax levy. The total tax levy for the 2023 budget was 70.5 million. The majority of it is for operations. That portion was 66 million. Um, and like the city, we are limited to either 0% or net new construction. So um, net new construction is, um, could be new buildings, it could be remodels, um, minus anything that has been, say, torn down. And then the debt levy is the next portion. Um, there is a little bit of a restriction on here, uh, which I'll go through in a, I think, in a little bit. Um, 
So the levy is limited to the principal and interest payments just for the calendar year, but there is a restriction on how much outstanding debt the county can have. Um, the 2023, the interest and principal payments are about 9.5. So that's kind of usual. It's usually maybe eight to nine and a half, close to 10 million each year, depending on how much outstanding debt we have. Except for this year, the county board has put in $2 million of sales tax revenue and some fund balance to lower the debt levy. So the overall levy went down for our citizens. And then the library system, you may know it as the Arrowhead library system. Um, they levy taxes on the towns and the village of Cookville. Um, basically, the municipalities that don't have their own library. And what the levy then is paid out to county libraries and libraries in the bordering states based on circulation, um, how much uh, rural residents have used those libraries. So there's a calculation done in there um, that 1.4 million then is, is spread out to those libraries. And then bridge aid, that's levied on towns only for bridge and culvert repair. So um, the, the towns, you know, talk to the county highway commissioner and as projects are being done or town roads are being um, reconstructed, there might be needs for bridge and culvert repair. And if so, um, there's a levy on the towns for those costs. The last couple years it has been zero. So what this means is um, the operations levy, I just kind of broke down that $66 million by the biggest users of the levy. So you can see it's a, it's a lot with the public um, safety and justice, the sheriff's office in 911, um, and then also human service, health and human services um, departments like the human services board and Rockhaven. Uh, and then the rest, the remaining 23 departments get um, about 5.3 million of the 66 million. So it's, as you hear about rising property taxes and such, it's with the um, county having these mandated services, it can be tough to find um, services to cut, which is generally why um, the operations levy tends to be at the max. So here's the historical outstanding debt. So believe it or not, we are allowed, our outstanding debt is allowed to be 5% of the county's equalized value. So in 2022, we could have had over $800 million worth of debt. I don't think there's any county that comes even close to that. Um, we tend to stay around the seven to 9% range. It, bumped up a little bit um, due to the new human services building, um, but that is typically where we are. And we try to um, format the debt payments so that there isn't a huge increase in the debt levy from year to year. We try to level it out. <coughs> that just gives you a little um, view of what the county's debt totals are. All right, so tax rate. So the average tax rate um, for county operations is $4.33. However, if you remember a, a previous slide, there's those limited tax levies um, for the library and bridge aid. So while that's an average, actually in 2023, um, the cities and the village of Clinton and Orfordville their tax rate was $4.25, while the towns and the village of Cookville was $4.52. So not a big difference, but there is a big difference. Just keep in mind, that's an average. <clears throat> and um, the tax rate is directly proportional to equalized value. So the county calculations deal with equalized value, unlike, um, towns, cities, and villages, which are assessed value. So 
cities, towns, villages may have, um, you know, someone, their assessed value might be 80% of market value, somebody else might be 90% market value. Um, there is a state that the, the, you know, the state requires it to be kept in a certain range and once it gets below a certain percentage, municipalities are required to update their assessments. For, um, so, City of Janesville, I lived in the City of Janesville, we were notified that they're in the middle of um, assess, updating their assessments and we were told, you know, it's gonna be an average of, um, each house is gonna be property average of a 30% increase in assessment, but that doesn't mean your taxes are gonna be raised by 30%. So, um, so here is the tax rate. You can see it's been going down, um, but that is because the equalized value has been going up. So, um, your taxes could stay actually exactly, exactly the same um, because equalized value is going up. Um, and then, so the county disperses, apportions its um, tax levy, the $70.5 million, to all the um, municipalities based on their share of the equalized value and then the municipalities take their portion and they um, portion it out <coughs> to individual properties based on assessed value, if that makes sense. All right, so what does the county spend their uh, money on? Um, you heard where we get our revenue, so now what do we spend our money on? So these are the biggest categories. We, again, as you can see, again from a previous slide where I listed the actual departments, health and human services and public safety um, are the largest users of the, the appropriations. That includes um, property tax, um, intergovernmental inter revenues, um, and uh, debt, that's mostly in the capital. So that is how uh, all the various revenues are divided. <clears throat> all right, so um, this are the categories that we report on. Um, general government um, is up at the top, it includes county board, administration, finance, the treasurer's office, um, real property who, um, they're the ones who collect all the information of property from the municipalities and print the tax bill. Um, public safety, again, is one of the largest spending areas, who's not just the sheriff and 911, but it also includes the courts, district attorney, and medical examiner. Um, and health and human services, human services, Rock Haven, public health, veterans, um, and then on down. Um, we do have um, a conservation development and edu education recreation, some small um, departments on there who do um, some very important work. So those are the types of departments and um, categories of, I would say, services that the county um, has. So, um, questions. I. I can show you the county's website. There is some very valuable information on that. So, let's see, how do I get there? Okay, so first, all of our meetings are open to the public. So if you go under government and click on here, it will eventually pull up. Um, there you go, a calendar of all the meetings that are coming up. Um, and you can take a look at the agendas. Um, and you can also, toward the bottom, you can take a look at um, the minutes and agendas from all prior meetings. 
In addition, the county board meetings are on YouTube, so you can go back for ways if you want to, you know, relive, view all the county board meetings. Um, then, a lot of the information that I went through quickly and at a high level, you go under department, administration, budget information. So, <coughs> here's the statistical report. It is a, a lot of numbers. Um, it, it will give you what the 2020 levy and the 2023 levy is um, by department. It also includes um, what their levy request was in 23, the um, changes that the county administrator made. Um, so it gives you, if you're interested in what various departments are getting for levies. Um, the, the high level overview, uh, again, of types of expenditures. Um, and again, some of the graphs uh, on balances, and here's a um, history of the various levies and tax rates, and so on. Else, what type of debt we have outstanding, um, and more. So, if you're really interested in numbers, you go to the statistical report. But what I find very interesting, especially when I started in county government, is um, learning what all the various departments do fees they collect, services they provide. So down here is um, by committee. Um, there's, uh, you can take a look at, so each department has a charter. So it, it um, gives in, in pretty good detail what each department does, what they're required to do, if they um, collect fees, um, so that, I, I, thought, I found that, especially when I first started with the county, very helpful. Human services is uh, very big, and so it can be difficult to understand all the services they do provide. Um, but here, it will give you, um, you know, a, a summary. And then, it will give you a <coughs> right, um, chart of what personnel they have. And then I find also useful, I actually use this all the time, is, I should put this in a little bit better. Um, okay, so here are the county administrator recommendations. So it will let it lets the reader know uh, what uh, the county administrator recommended why, if there's anything new, if there's something in particular going new going on with that department, but it gives you a nice summary where the revenues are coming from, um, um, funding sources, expenditures, um, and then uh, under the General Services Committee, for example, they have the Facilities Management Department. It can it gives a uh, uh, a summary by each project, how much each capital project is costing and, and how it's being funded. So that's again, uh, a useful, I think, resource for you. And just in general about how counties work, the Wisconsin Counties Association has uh, a website that gives a lot of information about counties and how they run and who they are. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Any questions for me? So if anyone has any questions, we're going to use the microphone to make sure that the video can pick it up and those who can't hear very well can, can hear the questions as well as the answers. So just raise your hand if you have something you'd like to add. This is a really quick question. Mm -hmm. That slide you showed that said a 4.3 average. Mm -hmm. now, what was that an average of? Um, so that was the average of um, the county um, prop, the county tax levy per a thousand dollars of um, assessed value, uh, utilized, utilized value, yes, yes, on your house. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't so, it the, isn't it the same four point three? Uh huh. 
for everybody, right? If you say it's a prime loss, what do you mean an average? Right. So, um, I'm not sure if I can get back up, but there are there are various types of levies that go into Oh, you're saying of those ones you listed, yep. the average is higher. Yep. Yep. So the, the operations levy goes a portion to everybody. The debt, uh, debt levy to everybody. Library, only to a few. I got it. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. Hi. Hi, Hi. and thank you. Yeah. Um, back like 20 years ago, the state told all the local governments, uh, and counties, you have to have a master plan as far as development goes. Mm -hmm. Does Rock County have a master plan? And I don't know, maybe it's so we, by the wayside or whatever. So we have a capital improvement plan so that um, May, beginning of June, uh, count, um, departments put together the capital projects, expenses that they need um, for the next five years. That doesn't mean they all get funded because as you can see, we have limits to what we can fund. So we have to really prioritize. Um, and then otherwise, a lot of the expenses for the departments, it's by department what we're mandated to do and how best we can do those services with the, the funding we have. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. um, does the <clears throat> on the local level, the state would always, uh, uh, my town, any town, uh, as far as road aid, if, mm -hmm. uh, you know, every year you had to send in a form saying this road is only gravel, but we'd like it to be blacktop, mm -hmm. and they would kick in some money. Uh, does the county uh, get road aid from the state? Yep, I know it's only county trunks. Right, so the county does get general transportation aids. It is based on, um, so they have this pot of money that the legislature appropriated. And then um, the counties have to submit um, a very detailed report every year that lists what expenditures and types of expenditures they've had. And then they, they um, divide it out like that. But then also the county, different from the towns, villages, and cities, contract with the state for state maintenance, uh, for maintenance of the state roads. So when you see a 90 being plowed, those are county workers. Um, you know, Highway 14, various state highways, the state contracts with the county to do, do that, so. Well then, uh, like this winter, mm -hmm. obviously they're not plowing as snow, you know, mm -hmm. snow plowing or, or salt, sand, whatever, as much. Uh, and I know they have, you know, whatever, salt shack full. Mm -hmm. All right, does that uh, money roll back into the like general fund then, what they have left over? Or? So the state only pays for the hours we actually plow, and they don't necessarily cover all the expenses. Right. They're not known for being terribly generous. So, um, but, for the property tax levy and, and general transportation aids that are, are put in there, yep, it falls to the fund balance. So then um, if the fund balance work, working capital um, gets to a level, we, we try to keep the working capital you know, pretty close to right. zero. Um, but if it does start to build up, we might put a few hundred thousand in the, um, in the public works budget for the next year to lower the tax levy. Um, Back when I first started with the county, was it 08, we had a huge, was that the year we had a couple 20 inch snowstorms or whatever. We did have to take a few hundred thousand out of the general fund mm -hmm. for those, but that doesn't happen very often. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sherry. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, I guess I have two. One is about the health and human services. So if that's half of your spending is mm -hmm. on health and human services, I'm just curious, what are the major expenses within that category? And maybe with an eye to what we know is true about demographics. And, right. and so thinking about how those might be changing over time too. And then 
My, my second question is just, um, you know, we've, we've asked some of the speakers to think about at a higher level what the challenges and opportunity are, are what those are for county government is, um, you and I were talking a little bit about that this past year there was pressure to use, you know, fund balance to reduce tax rates, you know, what, what are um, other kind of issues that you're thinking about or that you're anticipating down the line? Right, so um, for, First for human services, um, the health and human services, as you know, as you all know, there was this little thing called COVID. Yeah. Um, so starting in 2020, those expenditures really ballooned. Okay. Um, we had to add uh, extra project staff. Project staff means they're not permanent, um, mm -hmm. but for contact tracing, education, that kind of thing. Uh, for human services, um, they have uh, one of their divisions is economic support services. So again, though that department is administrating state programs. Um, there's a uh, behavioral health division. So that really, the needs really exploded also in the last couple of years. Um, and also as part of a mandated program, the county is responsible for the, for the cost for any resident that is um, committed under various state statutes to a mental health organization or a state mental health hospital, mm -hmm. um, like Winnebago. So those costs can be um, can be a thousand bucks a day, thousand dollars a day. So, and, and it's not because state one of the challenges the state hospitals set the rates, they can charge us whatever rates they can, but they mandate us to um, sometimes put citizens in those hospitals, but it comes out of the tax levy, which is um, limited. So that is one of the, the challenges. Um, there's uh, Aging and Disability Resource Center, uh, which is um, down near the old job center, South of Town. It's Kind of across the street in a new building um, for uh, elderly or people with disabilities it's kind of a one-stop shop for them to go there and find where they can get the services they need whether it's delivered meals or it's transportation to medical appointments or it's respite for family members or, or something like that there's a lot of expenditures that go into youth such as child protective services um, foster care payments um, Kinship care payments, which is similar to foster care, except the child has been placed with a relative. Um, the Youth Services Center, I still call it JDC sometimes, Youth Services Center. Uh, so um, uh, they just, yeah, there, there's just a whole, whole variety of things. And, and so if you go to the website, you can read, I'm sure I'm forgetting quite a bit, of where the health and human services but, and then of course, in there is Rock Haven, the county's nursing home, which uh, pre-COVID was doing very well. Um, but then when COVID hit, we limited the admissions because um, of the trans, how, how, you know, COVID's very um, contagious. And so uh, we, it, it wasn't full, which we still have fixed costs and such. So. Um, so the tax levy did have to go up with that, and now we have um, an ad hoc committee meeting to determine, you know, how can we um, build the nursing home back up. Part of the problem is um, we can't find staff. That's a common problem among everywhere. So if we don't have enough staff, then we can't admit more residents because um, we have to have a certain ratio. So um, if you're interested in Rock Haven at three o'clock, I believe this afternoon, again, if you go onto the website and look at um, the agendas, they're on the ad hoc committee agenda, there's a Zoom link. So you can go there and, you know, and listen to the meetings. Um, the health department uh, did get a lot of COVID related funding. Now that's um, kind of drying up. 
So uh, their tax levy is, is going up a little, even though all the project staff and, and such are gone, it's going back to, I should say, historical levels. And challenges, I believe you asked for? Mm -hmm. uh, mainly um, mandates. So back before my time, you know, intergovernmental revenues were 60% or more um, of our revenue stream. However, uh, as the state, um, their revenues are gets a, a little more constricted and there's more programs they want to do, um, their percentage of um, reimbursement mm -hmm. has decreased, which puts more um, pressure on the tax levy, which they limited. So, um, so that is, you know, a challenge, a big challenge for us. Um, and again, that new construction, even though you see it, you know, maybe a lot of um, projects going around, we may get, there was a year we only got a few hundred thousand, um, that new construction, you know, when the real estate market was down. Um, some years you might get two million, but when you're talking about a, a over $200 million budget, it, it adds up. Um, we lose a lot of staff um, to private sector, um, Bay County and uh, others that can pay more, but a 1% increase for um, a raise for staff is about a million dollars. So, so we're still losing you know, people as well. Yeah. Sherry, could you tell us how the mins and the maxes are set on your fund balance mm -hmm. and um, what your thinking is on use of that fund balance? So for the general fund, um, which has a majority of our expenditures, um, it's 20 to 25% of the expenditures of the general fund, uh, human services, um, airport basically, not just general fund expenditures, but expenditures throughout the county, 20 to 25%. Best practices is about 90 days, which is 25%. Um, I believe now at the end of 23, with using fund balance for the debt levy, it's projected to be at about 20%. So it's used for um, emergencies, uh, um, to um, help us, um, you know, lower some expenditures you know a lot of times we add, you know put a little fund balance in um, to departments budgets but we try to keep between 20 and 25 percent you know for cash flow purposes <coughs> we do our investment income maybe not a couple years ago but you know now that interest rates are, are, are coming up we should get maybe a million or two for the city of budget of interest income that then every year funds Programs. So we try to make the fund balance work for us while not keeping in excess. Um, for, say, um, departments with their own fund balance, such as uh, highway, um, information technology, we try to keep the fund balance just pretty, pretty low. Um, we can manage those expenses predict those expenses, expenses pretty much from year to year, but the general fund balance is what backs up those others. Such as Rock Haven, we had to put some fund balance into Rock Haven the last couple of years to help it out with operations. Okay. Is the county subject to any levy limits in the same way that cities and school districts are? I'm sorry, are they what? Is the county subject to levy limits? Yes. So it's the same as, as cities. Uh, so levy limit is either zero or up to net new construction percentages. The debt levy, um, those limits do not apply to the debt levy, uh, but it's for that applies to the operational levy. It's the same as you know for the cities. So if I read that right, and I think it was the second to last slide where you showed the percentage change in the education column. It said, I think 29% down in airport roses, I can't remember what, up. 
And so just what, why is that, or what would explain that, those major changes like that? Okay, so for, are you talking about pu public works? Um, for um, education and recreation is down. Mm -hmm. So. And then public works, right? Right. <clears throat> so um, the library system is a big reason that number is down because um, I, I mentioned Arrowhead library system before and that you know, we levy property taxes, oops, sorry, to spread out among the, the towns. Um, they also, Arrowhead Library was a standalone system just for Rock County. So they would also uh, receive state revenue that uh, they would coordinate, um, you know, the uh, bookmobile. Um, they would provide some aids maybe to the libraries um, but now, uh, starting in 2023, they are merging with Lakeshore's library system. And so uh, those types of operational expenses um, will now be shown in the Lakeshore's statements instead of the county statements. So, so you'll see pretty much a like decrease for the library in revenues as well. Um, Parks, we had um, a lot of extra expenses, additional expenses in 2022, uh, because some of you may know the county purchased the, um, the, the Boy Scout camp. And so we had more expenses in 2022, trying to get that um, up and running, maintaining um, for the public. And so now that those um, upfront costs to get buildings up to phone and everything are done, uh, 2023 expenses lower. Um, yeah, so again, uh, like up above general government, information technology, uh, we still had a lot of expenses trying to um, get all the software and everything up and running for cybersecurity and remote work. So if there's, you know, any other department you want to know about, I can try to answer that. <laughs> any final questions? Back up. Hey, Jerry, thanks. Um, where, where does the county track their ARPA funds, and where do you have the appropriations of ARPA funds into the budget here? Okay, so ARPA funds are tracked, and we have it in a, in a separate fund so if you're really like financial statements you can go on our website under our finance department and look at the financial statements there should be a column for arpa but the expenses uh, then are categorized depending on the department so uh, we have used um, some for um, homeless um, prevention so that would be under health and human services um, we used some for IT, um, for remote work technology. Um, we use some in public safety uh, for say um, disinfection, disinfecting units and stuff, stuff for the jail. So those are the funds, again, are shown at, at, depending on the type of use are shown in the various categories. No, um, it's um, just approved by the board. So if the board would approve a referendum, it would be advisory only. So, oh, I see. Yeah. So Say it again. The board would approve to be advisory only? No, no if the would. referendum is advisory only, yeah. yeah. Anyone else? What is the interest rate on the debt? So um, that varies from 1% um, to about 2%. We had um, some debt from back when, um, I'm trying to remember how old that was, 
2010, 2011, that was three and a half, four percent. But when the interest rates really went down, we uh, refinanced. Or we, it's called refunding, but I think of it as like refinancing a mortgage. So that's down to about 1.74, 2%. Municipalities tend to get a pretty good rate because um, they're you know, pretty stable. Okay, before I thank Sherry, um, I do want to say thank you again to Professor Laura Groove, uh, Jeff Adams, Tim Wheaton, where this idea kind of came up from. Uh, I also want to thank Amy Mitchell. She's in all the marketing and she's been recording and that. Lots and lots of work uh, behind the scenes, State Line Community Foundation for the lunches. Uh, but it wouldn't be possible, of course, without our presenters and, uh, and all of them have been very willing uh, they've taken either previous presentations and molded them for for our audience and our purpose, and we really, really appreciate that. Uh, as I said, we have Eric Miller who kicked it off. We had Rene Ranguet uh, from Blackhawk Technical College. Uh, we have two presentations from now uh, is Brad Bowl from the School District of Turner. And then uh, next month we have the School District of Beloit will uh, we'll have someone here to explain um, that budget. But today, thank you very much, Sherry Oja, for your presentation and enlightening us. Thank you.